it's a great pleasure to have this, this panel discussion. Uh, so we really like to take the time to discuss a bit more, to discuss about open source models and, and the community. And also maybe the first question to start would be, uh, is the gap closing or, or getting worse? I mean, meaning the gap between the commercial closed models uh, as compared to the open academic and open source models. What, what do you think? So, and what should be done about it? Anyone wants to go? Um, I feel compelled to go first because I had a slide on this. Um, uh, so obviously there is a gap. Like saying that there is no gap is, you know, um, kind of being like the ostrich putting your head into the, uh, into the sand. You know, there is a gap. Um, and that gap, I would say, is likely to remain for a while unless there is like a massive change, you know, of, of policy and everything. But I don't think the gap is widening. Like if you look just at compute budgets, for instance, um, you see that essentially the gap is fixed. Like there is a 1.5, maybe two years, because this model, you know, like GPT-4 was trained, you know, I think it's like nearly a year before it was uh, announced. So the gap is maybe wi like wider than it seems. But I don't think it's widening. Um, I do think there is a question right now of open sourcing uh, being very dependent on essentially one actor, which is Meta, <laughs> uh, which this morning at this presentation. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's like with Lama and everything, open sourcing is very dependent on this uh, right now because, um, well, you have Falcon as well, um, but essentially there is not that many people contributing uh, to this kind of model. And as the race is going to get much more expensive, like the big players right now, they are putting hundreds of thousands of chips for next year's training, for a single training. Um, the question is, you know, like, are the benefactors of open source going to be able to scale as well and to sustain that? So this is a big question. Um, I think there's also an angle on this on, like, RLHF and that kind of stuff, where um, I think open source is lacking a bit behind on this. Um, we are, like, I think in terms of, like, applying reinforcement learning and using that kind of stuff, we, we are not as good yet uh, as, uh, as the big players. Uh, I think we have a lot of progress to be made on, <laughs> to make on this. Uh, taking face, I know some people are working very hard on this, and uh, I think they will have some cool stuff to share soon. Uh, but yeah, so say, there is a gap, but I think it's not widening. I think we, we are doing our best to, to keep it. Uh, I don't know if Tim maybe have it. I know you contribute a lot to open source as well. So. <laughs> Yes, so what I can add to that is um, if you take the very long-term perspective, it seems that uh, soon we will be capital limited. So, so um, if I think about the data center that OpenAI is building or also what, what Google is building, they, they cost like uh, $10 billion a piece. And so if you think about it, okay, you double it another, another time or, or you, another 10x or 100x, at some point you just can't afford it anymore. It's too expensive. And so at some point we see a leveling off in cl a closed source. And uh, the advantage that we have sort of an open source, we just need one open model. Like we don't need 10 open models. And so um, in, in closed source, the other way around, everybody needs to train their own model. And so... Um, yeah, the question is, can we afford this one big training run to train a large model that's close to what they have in a closed source? I think there's a certain limit, but um, we can also take our time. At some point, we reach limits um, that are probably uh, capital, um, and um, then open source has time to catch up. Yeah, so definitely agree, right? So I think in terms of quality, right? So it's a multi-dimensional thing, right? So I think if you look at the verticals, I do think, I think open models are kind of catching up. Like if you know what you really want to do for this application, if you can actually fine tune in a targeted way, yeah, I do feel the gap is really closing, right? So I think the generic capacity of the model, I think there's a really kind of still a very big gap, right? It's very hard to evaluate, right? But I think, uh, yeah, so I think it's really closing. And another dimension is how much we can trust the model, how much we know what to get into the model, how much we can actually audit the process. There I think we are actually ahead, right? So in like a compare with a closed model, right? So I think I, I, I definitely agree with Tim that uh, in the longer term, if the, all the government and come together, right? So like how we build a telescope, how we build all those great kind of like a, like a, like hybrid telescope is kind of way more expensive than many, many the data centers, right? If the government come together and uh, with all those supercomputers, I do think as an open community, we have more compute, 
right? So I think it's really a matter of time and the uh, accumulation of expertise and education of the next generation of people who can train those models is actually going to make a difference. Yeah. That's really encouraging. Uh, thanks for these insights. So we mostly talked about the technical machinery now, but you also worked a lot on the data, right? And uh, the tech companies are also paying uh, millions of, of dollars to, to curate data, to pay people to create uh, data. So what should the open source community do about that? <laughs> or whoever wants to. <laughs> so, so one thing I'm thinking about is sort of instruction fine-tuning. And um, there, there are a lot of people that are not academics. They don't work in industry. They do it sort of as a hobby. And um, they're really good at curating high-quality data sets, developing algorithms to sort of develop uh, data sets that are automatically generated. And one example is Open Orca that, I, for example, like, where you sort of um, take some um, seed instructions and you make them more complicated, you make them more in depth, and um, with that you can great, create data sets that give you very high quality chatbot models. Um, yeah, if you think about sort of training data, it's a bit more complicated, but instruction data, I think uh, the community, the open source community, um, is moving very fast and can generate very high quality data sets. Yeah, I, I think like, so I think we can do even better, in fact. Like one of the biggest trends of the open source community is like its size, uh, how many people, you know, that individual, we can have so many individual contributors. And, you know, there is some criticism to have of like all of the fine tunes of the model. You know, some of them are maybe less good than others. But definitely some people are doing amazing things with this. And it, they have like Pathfinder, essentially a lot of cool idea. Uh, so for this, I think it's quite big. Um, I think personally, also another perspective that's very interesting to me is that I don't think the dependency on human annotation is very good for machine learning. Um, a lot of this, you know, there are lots of, there was a news article recently, a lot of this come, um, like the annotators are not in very good condition. Uh, some might even be qualified as borderline human slavery. Um, this is not great. Uh, and as a community, I don't think it's great that we build on top of this. Um, but the good news is that there is probably a pass forward. I think like self-improvement, constitutional AI, that kind of stuff uh, can really take off. And I think this is the kind of stuff, if we give to the community, like to the open source community, the tools to be able to do this, uh, if we make like easy, scalable RL recipe, like a code base that works, that kind of stuff, people will just go off with it and they will do amazing things. Uh, so this is like really one of the big axes on which I think there will be tremendous progress uh, in the coming like year or so. Yeah, so I think for, for any data projects, right, so there are actually two things that are very hard to do. The first one, how can you make sure the data is diverse and representative, right? And second, how can you make sure the data is sourced in an ethical way and also have very clean IP, right? So I see in, in front of the kind of data part, the open community have way larger advantage comp compared with a closed solution, right? If everyone contributes their data, we are by nature like diverse representative, right? And then if everyone donate the piece of data that they actually contribute to, we have a very, very clean IP to kind of get in a very ethical way, right? So I think in, in the long term, I think the open communities actually could be way ahead of the closed solution. We should be able to build something that's better than the closed solution instead of catching up in the long term. So I think the only thing is I think the community need a purpose, right? Instead of, oh, let's build ChatGPT, we need something that they cannot do, right? Maybe for small language, maybe for a more diverse uh, kind, of, kind of data site, right? So really try to think about things that community can do, but open AI cannot, right? Uh, and second, we need incentive. Right, to make sure people get uh, attribution, uh, to make sure people get acknowledged, to kind of incentivize them to actually contribute to the common purpose. I think once we have that missing piece, yeah, it's kind of, it's going to be amazing, this open data effort, yeah. Super nice, so that's encouraging for the quality of the data, and uh, you also talked about the diversity of the data, which maybe brings us to the safety aspect as well, not, not to produce bad content. And, uh, I wonder what what you guys think if this is a problem only of the second phase, the fine tuning phase. Do, is that where we achieve safety, or is it something to do also in the pre training phase and and how to organize this with the community as well? Like who who be responsible if if the models are open source? So 
Oh yeah, so so yeah, so I can start. So so like we have been building up this red program data set, which actual pre-training. So and that question is exactly something that actually bothers us a long time still today, right? How much should we align or kind of sensor or filter the pre-training data, and how much that should happen in the fine-tuning phase? We have no idea. So I think what we actually need is to have this systematic experiment transparent, reproducible, to actually tell people, oh, this is actually the consequence. Just like, like if you do 80% alignment in the beginning, 20% at the end, this is actually how the behavior of the model going to change, right? This is the false positive, this is the false negative, right? So I think we need this collection of systematic experiment to actually give us guidance. Um, yeah, so we, we, we think about that for a long time. The more we think, the less we know about the answer to the question, yeah. Yeah, I think it's sort of a difficult question. Um, there are some methods uh, where you, for example, insert control tokens um, into your pre-training pre data set to align it better um, or to make it less harmful. And these methods kind of work, but they also add things to your pre-training run. And if you have a very expensive model, um, you should be a bit more conservative because you're burning a lot of cash and you only have one try or very few tries. And so um, what we're seeing right now that um, alignment after pre-training kind of works. Um, the other question is sort of how do you filter your data? And I think um, that's a very open question. Um, we haven't settled that. Um, there's sort of um, this thing that if you have more biased data in your data set, then um, the model can understand what is bias. Um, but it might also sort of encourage the model on average to um, go in a biased direction. So you actually need to fix it. And so it's, it's a complicated question that probably needs to invest, be investigated a little bit more. I think uh, I actually really like something that Say mentioned about the fact that if we build this in the open, we have much better, like, essentially, we know how to get there. We know like what makes models safer. And I think this is part something that is missing a lot in the discourse currently. So um, right now... Um, a lot of companies are pushing the discourse, for instance, in front of the American Congress that open source is fundamentally unsafe. Um, but I think it's actually like, you know, security by, like security by obscurity is something that we know doesn't really work. Um, and I would like a very good example of like cool safety initiative in open source. Um, at DEF CON this year, at the AI village, uh, there was like this capture the flag contest where people were like essentially uh, red teaming language models. So like trying to break, you know, through uh, their uh, RLHF. Um, and by doing this, you know, you collect a lot of data and you can use this data to make the model safer. Um, obviously, OpenAI and Anthropic have invested an insane amount of money for this. Like, if you play with ChatGPT today compared to ChatGPT of December, it's much safer. You know, it will not be as much into, like, giving you, you know, stuff that it shouldn't give you, that it shouldn't help you do. Um, but we don't know how they got there. Like, we don't know they don't document their methods. Uh, they don't make their data available, whereas we could also use it. So in open source, there is a fundamentally different approach, and the event at DEFCON is kind of a, like a first uh, instance of that, of like, we can do it together, you know? Like, red teaming is something that's fun, like, that you can crowdsource, and where people can, you know, play a lot with the model. It's even fun. I mean, people were even, I was at the event, and people were having fun. So, like, it's even, you know, like, it's, it's a step further. Um, and I think this is actually how we build good safety. Like, good safety is not built behind closed doors with absolutely no idea of what's happening. Like, this is not how it works. Like, how it works is public audits and, like, I'm giving the tools for everyone to build safer models. I think it's very easy currently to say the community is not interested into safety, but I don't think this is true. I think this is simply because they don't have the tools to make safe models. And when we give them that, uh, and when it comes, you know, like, when we give them that, I think people will be very happy to build capable and safe models. So, yeah. Very nice. Uh, yeah, if, if you have Julien on the table, I would also like, maybe like to come back on the multilinguality. So I wonder if this was uh, maybe a bit lost at, uh, because people saw this very successful model also from, from Lama and Chinchilla where, where it was only uh, English to, to make things simpler. Uh, so what should we do to, to now get models which are which are representative in all languages. We already talked about diversity of the training data. Yeah. Fine-tuning data is fine, but pre-training data seems more challenging. Yeah. Um, we had a lovely discussion on this at the table last dinner. Um, actually, so there is a good example. Like There was a big initiative of a multilingual model, and it was Bloom. And Bloom, as you probably know, doesn't have that great performance. If you compare it to, to other models, it's not competitive. 
Um, and this is actually mostly attributable to machine inequality. Like, there are other things uh, in the architecture that are a bit maybe not ideal, but it's mostly the machine inequality. And currently, models are not very good at sharing information across languages. So, you know, one token of French is not going to inform that much one token of English. And it's even worse if you go to lower resources languages. You know, if you take like one token, uh, even, which is not really an, a lower, a low resource language, but even like one token of like Indonesian or like a specific, you know, a dialect will inform very little other languages. And that's trouble. Um, people like Palm, you know, OpenAI, um, what they do, they, they put most languages and kind of, you know, have multilinguality by accident, essentially. But you can see, you know, if you have played with ChatGPT, in French it's doing okay because probably there is still quite a bit of French and uh, French is close enough to English. But if you play with like ChatGPT even in Arabic, and Arabic is, you know, it's not a low resource language, it shouldn't be. Um, it's not good at all. Um, so I think right now there is a challenge on this, and this is actually a research challenge. I think like right now there is a big research challenge uh, in figuring out ways to have multilinguality that works when one token of English will contribute as much as one token of Arabic or, you know, as 0.9 token of Arabic uh, to the Arabic understanding of the model. Um, yeah, I don't know if this is something on which you have perspective as well. Um, a little bit, um, well, one sort of interesting observation. So, so I'm German, so um, I prompted GPT-4 to write some German poems. And so if you do that, um, what you often see is that the rhyme structure, it doesn't rhyme. But if you then translate it to English, suddenly it rhymes. So, so it seems that the model has an internal English representation and then internally translates that to German, then out outputs that. And so that shows that um, it's actually um, s something freaky is going on there. If your data set has a too heavy distribution in a language, then uh, the language model might be sort of centered in that language, and that can cause problems. Um, so... Um, I don't know. It seems there's a lot of things that we don't understand, and uh, maybe we need to go beyond sort of certain um, getting more data in sort of low resource languages. And there might be sort of um, particular things where neural networks get stuck early in training and be in a certain language, so to speak. So that's really cool. So it's kind of dreaming in, in English. That's, uh, that's funny. And uh, also reminds me of the talk yesterday by Eve Fedorenko from MIT. She was asking in, in the human brain also are the different modules. Uh, is there a module for just uh, the language as a small thing? But then the thinking is a whole different thing. So what about this whole uh, modularity? So could we have different modules? Like uh, one is different languages, one is thinking, or a small model which is fast, or a big model which is slow, or a model which is private and the model that is public. And how do they interface with each other? How can we make them model or a closed model and the open source model? How can we make them model or to talk to each other and democratize the whole, the whole system a bit more? So maybe that's also for two. Uh, yeah, maybe... Uh Okay. Um, so, so, so maybe one more thing about sort of language. So, so I'm um, I'm uh, a speaker in German and English. At some point, my language of thought changed from German to English, and so now I think in English. Um, but the interesting thing is, um, if I think in English or in German, it's different. Um, it has a different quality. Uh, and some topics are better in English, some topics are better in German. And so I think neural networks are quite the same. And you can benefit from that. If you have specialized modules in different sort of languages or different domains, it can actually improve performance. And so it's a very curious um, sort of question. Can we benefit from modularity? And I also work a little bit on that. But yeah, that's, that's enough for me. Yeah. So yeah. So I think for yeah for multilingual, right? So yeah. So definitely agree with Tim's point. So essentially, how much should a single model do, right? So for example, for the popular language, right? So should we really mix like two hundred languages together into the same model, right? So or maybe naturally every single model is the one one of the expert in the mix of the expert, right? Maybe for the like a low resource model, right? So, uh, like like language, right? So we should cluster them by the language family, right, by the similarity, right, by how much they can help each other. Maybe that's, that's a way to go, right? So, uh, I, 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 so I think another challenge in, in, in like building multilingual data and model is, so we are trying to do this red pajama data side, like, like red pajama v2, we are trying to make that multilingual. So, and we could just run the recipe on common crawl, we can get 200 languages, but then you realize that 
that we can only read maybe 1% of the data set. We don't really understand the 99% of that. So how can we deal with uh, projects that every single person can probably understand 1%, right? So I think there need to be a more organizational structure in actually how to build multilingual data and how to build a multilingual model and how can we make sure those like low resource language are actually being represented in the right way. So I think that's something that kind of very challenging. I have no idea how to solve it, but that's something that I think is quite unique for, for multilingual, right? yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah. Maybe, maybe also to to bring us to privacy. So, if if the if some model should really act on on my private data, uh, how could you do that? So maybe that's also an opportunity for the open source community because in the companies there's less of an incentive to do it. So, how how should we improve that? Um, yeah. So yeah. So I think about privacy. One thing that I think. That's a really well is the original like Bloom effort, right? So they have this essentially opt out uh, kind of option. If you see your data in the data site, if you don't want that to be there, you can actually send them email. They are going to remove it, right? So and then at some point, right? So the model going to be returned, uh, and uh, essentially your data will be gone, right? So I think that's something that I think the community will figure out a standard. Uh, and then we can follow it. That, I mean, that's why I think open data is going to help because you actually know, oh, this is actually my data, right? So instead of some closed model that you feel your data is there but you cannot prove it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think this is, um, like, we see a lot of discussion about, like, you know, chat GPT, for instance, surfacing potentially, like, personal information of people or that kind of things. Um, and there is also, like, so obviously, you know, there is, like, PII removal methods to remove like, you know, credit card numbers from data set, that kind of stuff. But there is also a blurry frontier of like, when are you like a person in the public or not? You know, like, there was recently, I think you said GPT, there was like this case of like a law professor or like a lawyer who got like smeared by chat GPT. Essentially, like chat GPT was generating stuff about him that was fake. But at the same time, he was kind of, of a public figure to an extent. So the model had learned of him through this way. So there's kind of a very blurry frontier here that I think is, actually goes beyond, like, just, you know, I think it goes beyond technical. Like, I think the solutions to this are not just technical. I think it's also, like, a question of, like, how do we think about privacy and all of that in, in the modern age, like, in the digital age. I think it's like there is something here that's a bit, like, that goes a bit beyond just all technical practices. Otherwise, I'm, you know, I'm kind of hopeful that you can RL this stuff, that, like, this sort of behavior away. Like, you can teach your model, essentially, oh, you know, you shouldn't do that. Like, you shouldn't talk about real people in a bad way, or you shouldn't talk about people in a bad way at all. That's probably just a better, uh, a better thing to do. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a complicated topic, and I think there is no trivial technical solution. Yeah, I, I don't think I have anything to add, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of work remains to be done. And uh, uh, another area where a lot of work remains, as uh, we heard it in, in several of the talks, is about the evaluations being completely broken. So maybe be, that's also an opportunity to have more uh, evaluations where maybe academia open source community could contribute. Uh, how, how to do this and what exactly is broken? Uh, is it really that people train on the test set or, or what is broken? And could we have like public evaluations of safety and quality separately or what do you think should, should be done there? Yeah, there, there are just a lot of things that are broken. I mean, uh, well, one thing is like test set, set leakage. So you don't exactly know like um, often um, have you trained on the test set or are portions that are quite similar to this test set. And so um, that, that sort of um, um, it makes uh, benchmarks invalid. There are some other benchmarks, and that's uh, what I've seen, for example, that are basically represent small pockets. And then the benchmark in itself uh, has only sort of very limited meaning. And so the best thing is just to run lots and lots and lots of benchmarks and aggregate them. And that gives you sort of a better estimate. So how to think about a benchmark is, it gives you some noisy signal of something. 
Um, but you have to be very careful what it actually measures. Um, there are a lot of problems like with um, where a benchmark doesn't necessarily measure what you think it measures. Um, yeah, and I can think you can smooth it out through many benchmarks, but um, I think as Julian also said basically in his talk is uh, we have no solution yet and uh, we probably not find it uh, very soon. Uh, right now it's a very messy issue. Um, yeah, I think, so, I, I think like the test set contamination kind of stuff, for instance, is like just the tip of the iceberg, because this is the kind of stuff for which you actually have a technical solution. Like you can dedupe, you know, in advance your evals, uh, you can measure memorization in your language model, so you could measure if this specific, like, you know, if MMLU has been memorized. Um, so at least there is some technical solution. Um, but anything like the misalignment between evaluations and uh, or usage of the model, that there is no technical solution currently. And it's definitely like, as you said, I think it's definitely a, a place where there is a lot of work to be done and research that can be done without having access to 10,000 uh, H100s. Like I think this is research that's more accessible. I think it's also research that's very hard because I cannot really think of a direct way to, uh, to solve this. But this is definitely an axis, and it's an axis that's really important because it's kind of the point I was making in my talk, but like evaluation are a driver of scaling. They are not just a motivation. It's not just a motivation that the models get better when, we, when they get bigger. We also need them to inform our process of scaling. And whenever we have one of the drivers that starts to fail, we are in trouble. And the free lunch, you know, of just making models uh, bigger is gonna stop, and we don't want to get that. So um, yeah, on this, it's like sadly, I don't have a very smart idea of how to solve this. Um, I think maybe in the open source committees there is something to do with crowdsourcing evaluation, uh, like the, um, it's the LMC's, um, what is it called, the LMC's bunch? Uh, yeah, the, the LMC's chatbot arena. I think this sort of stuff is kind of cool and hints at you know, other possibilities, but it's not perfect either. So yeah, lots of like, exciting space to work, but a difficult one. Yeah, so definitely great, right? So I think there are two things that benchmark are broken at this moment. So first one is most of the automatic evaluation benchmark, which probably most of the benchmarks, so they are for tasks like classification, like very short QA, right, with precise answer, or like retrieval type of tasks, because that's the only thing you can automatically evaluate. I mean, those are not the reason we are excited about large language model, right? We care about large language model because we can chat with it, right? So I think we are actually measure kind of a different thing in terms of the benchmark that we are having and the uh, people's experience, right? So that gap is kind of very hard to close, right? But if you do not close that gap, we are going to have a whole bunch of open models that's very good on those like uh, automatic tasks. But on the other hand, when you play with it, you see repeated answer, you see a whole bunch of those small things kind of really hurting the experience, but essentially won't show up in the benchmark, right? And second, I think the target of benchmark is a little bit homogeneous at this moment. People care about accuracy, but what about robustness, or about privacy, or about security, toxicity, right? So there's a whole bunch of dimension about quality I think we are not really measuring, right? So I think there's two things that I think coming to figure out how to, how to, how to do something about, right? Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, is there any question from the public? Uh, if you wanna add something, and then we soon go to the lunch break. <laughs> Maybe one question. Thanks. Yeah, so my question is about synthetic data. So we've seen in like the instruction tuning, like, you know, R slash local llama, everyone goes nuts with like GPT-4, talking to ChatGPT, talking to Bard, and building very diverse and interesting data sets. And, you know, the wizard LM models and the evil instruct technique are like this great example of doing that. I'm curious from the perspective of pre-training, um, could we do something similar? So, you know, Julian talked about this like upper limit of like, common cruel, could we get the kind of diversity and stuff and the quality we want uh, just using, you know, synthetic data? So, so I know a, a colleague uh, actually works on the exact problem, basically generating data for pre-training. Um, I mean, th theoretically, if it works, you can just generate more and more and get a better model, generate more and more and so forth. Um, uh, but uh, I think that's unlikely to happen. There's some uh, probably point where you, similar to GANs, have mo mode collapse. So um, you get maybe a model that's better, but only in a very n narrow sort of sense, and it breaks down in other things. So, um, yeah, I think it's an empirical question, but I think... Uh, um, it, it wouldn't work properly that naively. Um, there's probably some trade-off there. 
So for pre-training, I think it's very difficult. Um, I would on pre-training, I would push that if you want to do this, you have to rethink pre-training from scratch. Currently, pre-training is this very naive approach of just I feed the model a trillion of tokens and I hope for the best, and it works. Um, there is surely better stuff to do, it's like curriculum learning, that kind of stuff. But many people have tried and many people have failed. <laughs> like it's one of these things that I think is like a very enticing idea that ends up, you know, not working at all for reasons that are, you know, maybe fundamental actually. Um, but I think one part of like the reason why it works well for adaptation, like for you know downstream fine tuning and everything, is because um, any downstream adaptation is secretly distillation in disguise. <laughs> like, when you are doing this, you are actually distilling the larger model. Even RL is distillation. RL is essentially you are distilling the reward model uh, into, the, into the other one. So it's a weird view of it, but I think it's like the kind of view that you can have. Um, and that's why it works well in that case. And I think it's a very unique uh, setting for it. So for, um, while I think it's an amazing direction for adaptation, and I think there is a lot of cool stuff on self-improvement that you can do, like, even you don't need a larger model, essentially, you can get the effect of a larger, you know, if you, if you have a model, you generate like a bunch of completion, then you only take the top rated one, which is like the feed me algorithm from, from OpenAI, uh, which powers some of the first version of Instruct. Um, well, essentially, like then you are kind of like discriminating and improving upon, like you're doing self-improvement with some external feedback. And you can also do this if you find ways to make inference more expensive, like to spend more time on inference to get one thing and to say, oh, this is going to be a better quality inference. So a dumb way to do this would be with beam search, but you could also do this with like Monte Carlo tree search or whatever. The caveat that finding an objective for Monte Carlo tree search that is general to language is probably one of the hardest challenges that there will ever be, but a lot of smart people are working on it, so hopefully we'll solve it. Um, then you can distill that because models, like large language models, are very good at distillation. They are amazing, essentially, at learning, you know, like from something else and distilling it into themselves. So I think that's why it's so successful on fine tuning, whereas pre training is something different. How different it's hard to qualify. I think we lack a theoretical understanding of, uh, of the behavior of these models. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so, so I think there is the whole spectrum about data being synthetic. Right. So there's a purely synthetic data that come out of the data that out, like out of nowhere. And then essentially the other extreme you only use real data that you get from common crawl, right? So I think the sweet point would probably be somewhere in the middle, for example, like a large language model have multiple components, right? So there's all those knowledge inside the model, and then there's the language part of the model, right? Maybe you can use, for example, Freebase to actually generate data to make sure the model knows more knowledge, right? Like instead of asking it to actually read the Wikipedia, and you do have a structure of Wikipedia, right? You can generate a whole bunch of things to put into the model, right? And maybe you can use another language model to help you to reason about data quality, right, to understand propriety, and people are doing a whole bunch of those, right? So I don't think a pure synthetic view going to be the solution, but on the other hand, I do think synthetic should be part of the pre-training process. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, the pre-training part is kind of happening whether or not we want it. Like it's already contaminated. The next model is already having to deal with this. So. Uh, yeah, maybe one last quick question and then we get lunch. Um, so you were saying um, that the open, open source community is catching up on the you know, closed model and so on. Uh, in some sense, so far what we have achieved is uh, replicating what the closed community is giving us for free. Uh, GPT-3, Chinchilla, and so on, and that's on the pre-train, LHF on the, on the other side. Um, now that we are in some ways creating that world where, ooh, there are the bad guys that are closed and, and we are the good guys who are open sourcing and so on, like, like a natural reaction to that is to not publish anything, yeah. and so now what do we do? Yeah. Uh, um. I, I want to push back by the just on the bad guy thing. I don't think like, I think sometimes we take this stance as a bit of a theatrical thing, but the reality is that we all know, like everyone knows each other in the community. We like a lot of people are friends <laughs> across, you know, labs and everything. So I think it's like, it might exist for politics. Like it might, there is genuinely a concern about politics on this, but uh, it might exist, but it doesn't exist actually among researchers. Uh, I think so. Um, on this, actually, I also want to push back on the idea that um, 
it's, we have mostly been reproducing for large models. That's true. We have not like have had like a large model that's larger than the closed source. But I think it's mostly a question of resources because in terms of like science or engineering, actually a lot of innovation come from open source. And there are a lot of examples, but one of them is flash attention. Flash attention is used in all production runs uh, at large, you know, uh, in, in closed source. And it comes, you know, a lot of it, a lot of them discovered it through Tridao, through an open source contribution. And you can find many such things, actually. You can find many elements that we are using systematically that have been essentially pioneered uh, by academic labs and all open source communities and that get used. Uh, there is a list on Twitter about this right now because of the, you may have read about the GPU poor thing on Twitter. And there's someone who compiled a list of like all of the open source or academic innovation that came like from being GPU constrained. Another good example, I think, is the work of team actually on quantization, um, which some of these labs have done in private but Tim did it without, you know, like looking essentially at their copy and is able to now share it with the community. So I think like the reproduction angle might be true for the scale, but I'm not entirely sure that it's true for like the exact mechanism. And yeah, I'm, I'm a bit 50-50. You mean the engineering, yeah. I think this is more for resourcing. I think it's more, because on this, you know, like, I cannot look, I don't know actually like the pipeline that big companies use. I mean, I've talked to engineers, so I have some idea, but I can't really, you know, copy it directly. So I have to reinvent it myself to an extent. On this, I think it's mostly a resourcing. I think it's mostly that, you know, if tomorrow a government, this was, I think, say you, you propose this, you say like the cost, you know, of the LHC, for instance, is much larger and you propose building like, you know, common infrastructure. I think, you know, if there was an initiative like this, we could build engineering that's like, you know, out-competing the, uh, some of the big labs. I don't know if you want to, yeah. Yeah, so I don't think the relationship between big company and community is competition, right? So I mean, this is not the first time the community asks this question that, oh, what is our relationship with industry, right? So I think computer science have a very very good tradition to balance like these two parts, right? Essentially, open source communities, mostly students or professors, right, is producing the next generation of people who will actually work in the big company, right? So I think it's in everyone's interest that these two parties kind of get synced, like in some way, and I, I'm actually pretty optimistic that, that they will be, right? So yeah, that's my personal view. So how I think about it, and if I look into the future, um, is that if you have really sort of frontier labs, <clears throat> they can make the breakthroughs that really bring us to the next level. But then you also need to diffuse all the technology through, throughout society. And uh, just the open source community is like really good at that. Um, these will not be the best models, but they will be really useful and very useful for everyone. And so it feels like there's maybe a little bit of competition, but... Um, each player has also certain roles where they are just um, the best at. And I think um, if, if um, everyone focuses on their roles, we see like uh, broad benefits across, across um, everything, basically. 